Uh, does anybody have any addition to the uh, notes from last week? Did we get the, uh, oh wait, not the notes, Ryan. All right, if I see no uh, uh, corrections or additions, uh, do I have a motion to accept the minutes? I'll make a motion to accept. Thank you, Jess. Uh, Jess says, uh, motion may accept it. Is there a second? Thank you, Steve. The minutes are accepted as submitted and we'll go into the appropriate file. All right. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to put this up there. Check in minutes, community engagement update, UNHSI, CAP, RAF, SPBRC. Uh, spaces, if you have anything to add? Yes, Kate. Uh, I just, I'm going to give an update on the Keeping History Above Water Conference at the end. Uh, that's okay. I just put, I want to write with this ad. <laughs> We've got some slides for the UNH thing. Do you want me to like email them to you? Or like, we don't also don't need them. I yeah, just have them. Do you have them? Oh, you have them there? Um, yeah. Water conference something. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, um, This is housekeeping. I'd just like to know all the meeting dates for the year because I noticed one was December 28th, which I don't know how many people will make it up. So I'd like to just check the meetings for the year. Okay. John Kennedy is one who kind of keeps that updated. And where is it updated? Does everybody else know? Uh, Google like Docs. Google. Yeah, it's a Google Doc page. We can uh, send it out. Okay, that'd be yeah. great. Yeah. Thank you. That's all I need. Okay. It doesn't have to be on the agenda. Okay, it's real. We had a, a meeting, Peter and Tori and I, with uh, Public Works today. We could give a really quick update on that, five minutes or less. Anything else? Okay. Oh, I didn't. I didn't do my checking. Oh, I check. My two COP slide. I'm grateful I got to be and am 85. So what I bring now is a greater reflection on the evolution of my own psyche. And for years, I've been interested in sustainability and also interested in who am I from a spiritual sense. And so what I bring, I think now, is an understanding for me that sustainability and spirituality for me are one in the same thing. On the deepest level, I am not my ego. I am not this body. I am not my thoughts. I am not my emotions. On my deepest level, I pre-existed all of that so that they could impinge. Something had to be there to receive consciousness. I don't know what that is. You call that the great mystery. But sustainability on its deepest level is not an intellectual knowledge that everything is connected, but getting from the head to the heart that we are hurting each other, the planet, the biodiversity. And when we get to that point, there's a powerful motivation and energy to do the best we can with what we have, where we are. And that's to me what the check-in was about. Everybody here was doing what they can with what they have, where they are. And it doesn't make any difference on what scale you're working at. But what's amazing to me is that the committee is attracted 
many of us who are thinking both at the largest scale and down to the nitty gritty. So I bring, uh, just I'll wind up with an activity. I was asked to do an introduction to meditation the other day at a workshop. And I realized, wow, I gave some people some useful tools. And so I want to do that wherever I go, is to bring Thich Nhat Hans, the art of Zen, and saving the planet. Because ultimately, we need to be working from a deep level to make the change we need to work and to sustain us. And this could be the best hour of our lives. That's it. Okay. Having said that, uh, are we getting ready for the next uh, item? Is that what I see on the screen? I'm just getting it on here so we can have that. Okay. Uh, so, what item are uh, is does anybody want to go to? I can give a quick update, and I'm assuming where it says, yeah, the uh, drafts. drafts. So, yeah. the um, at the last city council meeting, which would be two weeks ago this Monday, I brought forward the draft ordinance, which we discussed. And it was referred unanimously to both the governance committee, which uh, Councillor Cook chairs, and to the legal department for review. So when we, I don't know when we're going to get a report back from either committee, but when we do, I'll be sure to let everybody know what the next steps are. <clears throat> just like that. <laughs> just, just your legal background and what you know, you know how to write an ordinance. I love it. <laughs> All right, so we just got through that. Um, one small uh, thing on that. I wasn't here for the meeting when you all discussed it yeah. last time, unfortunately. Uh, I looked it over and the, the only small concern I have because we have the benefit of the two of you on the council right now is it said a member of city council. Correct. Not open to more than a. The only reason why I did that was the mayor's big concern, I understand, is the number of people on the committee already. Mm -hmm. And if we're trying to narrow it down, and I don't remember what the cap was, but if we're capping the committee at, let's say, 13 people, I don't want a second city councilor to take the spot of just a resident. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that was the thought process there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Steve, you reminded me that I'm in a similar situation. I also was not here for the last meeting. Uh, and I, so I had a question about uh, like the role, I think it was under the roles and responsibilities of the committee. And I, I wondered if, so the job of the committee is to advise and, you know, so right the council. Okay. So knowing that, it's, there's a lot of other organizations out there that sort of may interact with the council and the city in various ways. I wondered if there wasn't maybe language that we would want to think about putting in there. Should the should this committee serve as like a conduit to the council from various outside organizations? Should should there be a direction of of how that flow should go to the, or is it not worth doing that? I just wanted to bring that up. So I'm going to say that back, see if I get it right, to try to, this organization to try to encourage other organizations to bring their ideas to us to bring to the council. Well, if there was, a, if there was, because there's many sustainability organizations right. out there floating around the town, if they wanted to approach the city in a certain way with an idea that they want to do something, I was just wondering, should they be steered through this committee and we approach the council on their behalf or should, is that going too far or is that? I think ideally that's how it would work. I but don't know. Not necessarily spelled correct. out that way. Yeah. Correct. So right. no, we could, I could definitely tweak the language. So the nice thing is it still has to go back before the council. So we could, any changes which we think should be made, we could make to the ordinance before. So I could definitely take a look and make a stab, but be essentially recommending that other organizations present to this committee. And work with us. Yeah, that was my only thought when I when I, I like it. it. Yeah. A lot of times, it 
sort of works that way backwards already. Like we've had a number of proposals where people like wrote in something about solar for the city and then they referred it down to us. So right. it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. I just don't, yes. But like I said, I didn't know if it would be worth sort of spelling, spelling, spelling it out. out. So yeah, yeah. if there was an organization out there, they they wanted to go, oh, well, this is how it's typically done. It's kind of, and the rules are written and everybody kind of knows how it's supposed to go. But so I just wanted to mention that um, whether we do or don't, I just wanted to bring it up. I like it. Um. I just thought I would note that um, governance committee is going to look at this um, in, on June the 12th. Um, so if we want to add any language or if you want to suggest any language, governance committee would be happy to sneak that in already so that it gets legal review um, because it had one review already at the governance committee and we asked legal to take it over and review it and then come back to us at the next meeting so that hopefully we can get it finished soon. The other comments, or we? I, I was well. I was just going to say, <clears throat> Jess, you come to mind. Like you are a sustainable sort of uh, stakeholder in the greater area. So I don't know if if, if this if the committee would serve as a liaison, or if it, you know, I guess we're limited by by how many people, how many members we can have by size. But um, you would, for example, have a direct like a direct link, you would be um, not a liaison, but you would actually be representing a business or an organization. And, um, you know, would it be possible or, or helpful or even possible to have a couple um, either business owners or uh, leaders from, from organizations, you know, we, we have those resources, we know who those people are for the most part, or should we think about, and again, I don't know how this would work, this is thinking out loud, um, you know, somebody from Chamber of Commerce or or someone that could, if this committee becomes more of like a liaison, like a touchstone for people going to the city, you know, uh, how do we reach the people we want to reach? How do we make this committee available uh, to those stakeholders? That's just my thought process. So where do we, where do we land on that? Well, I, I would say the first time we started to talk about this and sort of to Josh's point, uh, we had thought, oh, maybe we should make sure we have a seat for this person and this, this organization or this group of people. Mm -hmm. And then it started to feel like we were delegating all the right. seats out yeah. to the committee already. So like for me at that point, my priority was to make sure that students always had a seat on the table. So I would rather see you here than have a whole bunch of other seats. Yeah. But that's my, yeah. no, that, and that was part of the earlier discussions that we that had. Probably buried back there. But you might, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if you were here for that one because we did have that yeah. similar, okay. like yeah. there are lots of pieces of the puzzle that would be helpful to have here at the table, but how much do we dictate that or how, or do we just invite them to come and participate yeah. and engage? Great. Okay, thanks Josh and Kate for that. Uh, where do we go next? Does somebody have one? Or you say a number. We have community engagement update, UNH, SI, change makers, CAP update, RAF, we've done water update, uh, public works. Okay. We can go. Okay. Yeah. 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 The um, slide show, it's the UNH one. UNH one. Yeah. Um, so while we're pulling that up, I'll just give like a brief overview kind of what we did. So um, it was a little bit of a crazy process. Yep. Um, but so basically, Ben did a ELO, which is an extended learning opportunity through Fortunate, where um, you, what did you think? Explain what you so did. in the fall, as a uh, as a course at the high school, I did an extended learning opportunity, um, which was essentially a self-guided, uh, it was a, a semester, a, sem a self-guided block where I- um, You have to click for it to like, the words. Yeah, I don't know, it's yeah. weird. I, I just want to, I got to share a screen. Oh, okay. And the ELO was, uh, it was actually going to be a lot of things. And as 
often happens in life. You have, you know, 10 great ideas and one or two of them make it into the final product. So it, it, eventually I refined it. And at the time I was also applying to college and uh, narcoleptic. So a few things got lost in translation. Um, but it turned into a report about really my journey as a student activist, uh, if you could call me that, and with sustainability and how sustainability uh, fits into our public schools in New Hampshire and identifying a couple areas of change, uh, you know, areas of potential change and identifying some, um, some common tenets of activism and how that benefits students. Uh, and it wasn't it wasn't a fantastic report, you know. It was it wasn't was, eleven pages, but and I can <laughs> read all of it. <laughs> so that was the report. That was the final report, which I passed in for the grade, and that was and that was done. And then um, there is a competition at UNH through their Sustainability Institute every year, um, and it is basically based off of like it's kind of a tar oh my gosh Shark Tank style sort of. Um, like judging competition and Ben wasn't really super you need a pro like you you have to have a product and Ben texted me one day I was like do you want to miss a Friday and go present this and I was like yeah sure little did I know I would have to make an entire product well, with I cost didn't, projections I didn't want you to make a product either essentially my report didn't have any product in it so I it made one personal report. <laughs> and so I was encouraged by somebody at the school to submit to this change maker challenge and I said well it's not really what they're looking for um you know I'm I'm done and dusted with the whole thing um so then I so <laughs> eventually I was worn down enough so that I said okay I'll submit um and then as we were we were talking about it and we were going to have Laura Lee help us and she didn't have time so um I was kind of like you know how am I going to make this all come together and um I asked eco club I didn't ask you specifically. No, you asked Eco Club. I, asked I Eco saw Club right and Darla stepped up because yeah. Darla, Darla steps up, and <laughs> um, she and a couple other Eco Club members it was Darla. cobbled together. It was Darla, Darla, you mostly Darla, <laughs> uh, cobbled together a a sort of a product that could dovetail with my report. I think we should have won. We and didn't win. Compete at the UNH. So it, it came together at the last minute. Darla did a great job and went and presented it. I wasn't there. Someone we lost to someone that made a new um, bio something engineered phytoplankton or something. So this is a. a I'm not. I'm full like. Obsessive I'm happy with. with yeah, I'm happy money. with my outcome. So um, <laughs> I created you can go to the next yeah. slide if you don't mind. So I created a composting education. Um, you got to click it again. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So this is just a little statistic. Um, typically schools, um, in the U S create an average around 34,000 pounds of food waste a year. And I know for a fact in Portsmouth that we don't discard of it properly. Um, so that kind of ties in at the end. So this would be elementary school. If you want to double click over, I don't know why the words are doing that. It's weird. All right. You're good to go on. To the next one. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. There we go. All right. So we kind of made three stages within. So there's three different, you know, you have elementary, middle and upper school. Um, so this is elementary and we have early development and it's just creating like a basic understanding of composting because nobody know, nobody's born and knows how to throw away their trash. You're taught it. So in school, if you're taught that your food scraps go in this bin and everything else goes in this one, it's going to make growing, you're going to grow up with that like knowing that and you're going to carry that on with you. Um, so then we go on to middle school and middle school, we created composting fluency, which would be the understanding, the brief understanding behind what composting is, why you should do it without really scaring kids, but getting them to understand that there's a purpose behind it. You're not just making them do something. Um, we found that that will really help students. And then if you want to jump forward a few slides, that's the junior high. Okay. Yep. And then the high school, um, this is kind of where our business kicked in. So we were supposed to, if you wouldn't mind going to the next okay. slide. Um, so we were, I created a idea that would be, uh, the high school would be bringing in compost from all of the school districts or like the middle, middle schools and whatnot. And bringing it in, taking care of the compost, which we would then sell as part of the business finance programs at our school. So the business and marketing kids would be responsible for finding buyers. We'd work on cost projections and all of that stuff. And it does take a while to get it to start working because you need those kids from kindergarten learning how to do it because 
it's really hard to teach at high school to change those habits. Um, but once you did, if we did get it up and running how we wanted, that the program would be self-funding. So we could bring on a part-time staff member that would be able to take care of the compost and that's their job. Um, they would be able to transport it. And by the end of like year one, it would be start bringing in money and we wouldn't have to do anything about it. Um, and then the the rest of the money that was made because we do you remember the number? If it this worked, high, if we it wanted, it was high. like I ninety thousand oh, dollars. I couldn't put a year around how much money it was projected to make, but I said around ninety thousand dollars a year. So that would go to paying someone to take care of the compost, and that's if you're selling all of it, which obviously can be difficult. But it would create like a hands-on opportunity for our students, um, both in the understanding composting and bettering our community, but also from a business standpoint, understanding how businesses work, um, finances and all that stuff. Um, so that's kind of just the overview of it. Um, so our product was just compost, but it kind of had a bigger picture, more impact, um, I thought. So that was kind of what we threw together. Yeah, I heard I wasn't at the competition because I had to give a speech in Plymouth the day before. So I didn't want to miss two days in a row. But I heard the presentation went very well and that the idea was well received. They drill you with questions for 10 minutes straight. Whether you have two not. minutes to present and they get, I can, I couldn't even use my slideshow. That's so sad. <laughs> so that was our, that's our update. That's our little, <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah. Any comments? Nice work. Thank yeah. you. Darla gets credit for this whole part of it. I was, in an ideal world, we could start doing it, but you gotta get yeah. everyone on board yeah, or something multi, like that. Multi it would take a long time here. to get going because you gotta get, you gotta get it. You gotta start at the bottom. Get How the much room. Would you need for the compost? Um, so we actually wanted to invest also in a digester, which I don't know if we, we've talked about in here. At least starting with one. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, we've been trying to get Eco Club to buy one. We have the money to buy like five of them, but we don't buy them. And um, but so that was kind of where that idea came from is that we wanted to implement more composting in the high school but then we've noticed that education is a huge issue we've walked around our school with bins and been like put that there and they don't do it so starting at a young age and getting them to like learn from elementary school having a compost bin in their classroom they're like i'm an apple i'm gonna put it there then you start to know that hopefully they burn it home and it's just kind of like a chain reaction. And, and it, it's like for what you'd say systems thinking, like you you can't, uh, I mean, you can try and you've had limited success, but you can't, uh, if you will, retrofit the composting mentality to somebody who has been just throwing things in the trash for their whole life. It, it will take a long time and it will be met with yeah. limited success. And we, we have a Mr. Fox subscription at the high school which is X amount of dollars a month, like and it's several thousand dollars a year or whatever, or it might be more than that. Yeah. And um, they, uh, I think this was before COVID, rejected most of our compost because it was contained. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're throwing away money, um, incinerating money on a service that looks great on paper. And then in practice, it, we just it continually did not work. And then the efforts that, that students tried to make at the high school level weren't really uh, sticking because that mindset wasn't wasn't there in the first place. There's not an understanding. So the the opportunity or like the area of improvement that we identified was that we have to start Young, step one up. and start upstream, and then that system will eventually carry carry. And even if it's not like turning into a business where we're selling it, because that's not really our main goal. That was kind of just because we needed something that was profiting. Um, even if like we were just giving it away to local farms and just disposing, or even if we were using, or using Mr. It, or using Mr. It for Fox, school, school gardening. Yeah, yeah something like that just to get it implemented in our school. That's like our main focus was just composting and a curriculum that would allow that to. And there work. is some synergy with Laura Lee's work as well, mm -hmm. but because Laura Lee's uh, composting curriculum didn't have anything to do with Portsmouth High School, at least in its development phase, like it, it wasn't connected to the high school. Um, it wasn't it wasn't the right time to to present that, uh, but there there are definitely um, good ideas out there, and you know, with the right commitment, people uh, it, it, these ideas could could you know they're they're plausible they're feasible they could help. I do have a question. Yeah. I guess one for each of you, uh, Ben. Do you know when your last day representing the Eco Club will be on this committee? 
this might be my last meeting. Okay. And I just took a job that is seven to five on one of the days is Thursdays. And I'm like, after a 10 hour shift, another two hour meeting might be difficult to swing. So this is potentially my last <laughs> meeting. Um, but that said, if I could come and sit in the corner and hide as a community member, I would keep doing that <laughs> as long as I could. And there's no need to sit in the corner and hide. And then, uh, <laughs> Donald, you know, like if you'll be able to kind of slide in and fill in Ben's shoes. No, was that? Oh. Yeah, this is also okay, Darla's, so this is Darla's last meeting. This is pretty much, yeah. I sent a brief email to Effie and I, I'm playing field hockey in college. And with that, I am training nearly like four hours a day. Um, and my training happens to start falling right on Thursdays. Um, that being said, <laughs> I will definitely try my best to get here when I can. And like, we'll always like, if I have things and we'll work, Ben and I will definitely stay. Can, we're both graduating in like a week or two. It's creeping up close. It's getting us. close. Um, but we're, we're staying in contact with um, Eco Club and we're hoping to get people coming in here. So we have hopefully we can. And we've had um, Gabe has come before. Mm -hmm. I believe Evie Douglas has come. Mm -hmm. And I believe Jillian Richmond has come to one of these maybe once. Yeah. Um, and there will there will be younger students. That this There's is not the year three for us. We've been here for this three years. This is year two or three. Oh, we started this. I remember we came and we were like all scared. I think I was a song, mm -hmm. but the, on the, Zoom. long story yeah, short, it, this is not the end of Eco Club at the Blue Ribbon Committee. Uh, it's the end of Ben and Darla. It's just a trend. Yeah, it's a trend. <laughs> oh. um, but the momentum for all these projects in Eco Club is very much uh, is still there, and SS4S will still be. Uh, it's again, that's another organization that's in transition right now. Um, but as long as that organization continues to exist. There will be people uh, involved who will want to come to this. And I will want to come to this <laughs> from, from as I haunt them from Boston. So I'll haunt them from Michigan. You can haunt them from Michigan. Um, yeah, no, this might be this might be sort of winding down for us, but it's a little melancholy. Yeah, a little sad, but um, there is congratulations right to future. thank you both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Passing the torch. Did, somebody, did you want to say something on the presentation? First off, I, I think it's it's always amazing what people create when there's a lot of passion behind it, as opposed to just some sort of a deliverable. Maybe something started as an assignment. I need to do. Yes. I need to do something, but then you put some energy and momentum behind it. It's really interesting when you put different perspectives on it and what you can create. And what I really liked about this particular project is anyone that's done. Uh, so I think kids spend a lot of time sitting and it's a way that you can move around. It's also tangible. So you can see how much waste that yeah. we're creating. And a lot of times it's out of sight, out of mind. Also, it get, anyone that's done gardening knows how much of a workout it is. Uh, so it's some exercise. Mm -hmm. And it also is instilling this mindset at a young age yep. and building into the culture. And when you go into other countries or different environments, Germans, for instance, or that's where I was before, the kids are used to sorting glass, mm -hmm. paper, compost. There's barely any tr trash. Everything is going back in. And, and a lot of the reason behind that is because it's, it's such a, it's a landlocked country and there's not a lot of place to put it and they want to upcycle. Um, but I like that it's putting it in at a, at a young age and it just builds this in. So it just becomes a way of life. It's not a trying to shift yeah. Yeah. people's perspective it's just ingrained in of course we do that of course we compost yeah and yeah i i really like the angles that you yeah. that you took on this thank you and all hands on deck maybe sometimes there's pass or hitting the uh field hockey ball to other people but <laughs> <laughs> seems like a good team sport okay so that would be uh what number was it? I think it was um four. 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 Okay, got it. I think we should have won. I think you did. <laughs> uh, yeah. What was that? You did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I won my so heart. I'm going to tell you what you won because I'm really old and biased. <laughs> we start teaching systems thinking. Uh, for sustain, or rather, we start charging sustainable living. After two semesters, we realized 
That's about the individual. Mm -hmm. That's why we invented the course systems thinking for sustainability. Because if you really want to make an impact, you need to be system thinking. And start at the first first step of that system. You guys touched my heart tonight. <laughs> if you said you want the younger kids to become, you are already the kinds of folks who could think in systems as we try to be. So you won whether you know it. <laughs> Thank you, Bert. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, we have community engagement, cap, water, uh, update, public work, where are we going? Public cap update. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Who was that? I always just put the cap update on there in case people want to know what's happening. Since I have my email open. Oh, now's yeah. If, now's a good time. If you can. So, <laughs> I, no, I didn't mean no, that way. <laughs> As if it that's there. Okay, so climate action plan is underway, as we all know. Um, today, I sent out a, a newsletter that hopefully, this is where I touched on my lack of social media skills. Um, <laughs> Hopefully it'll be a monthly newsletter if I can figure out how to do a good job of it. But um, it was sent out to 87 people that so far have given their emails that are interested in Climate Action Plan. Um, and it just was sort of full of what's been happening in the last month and then upcoming events. Um, we put in things like the things that we're tabling at, so like Market Square Day, River Fest. Um, we put in, um, Bert and Bill will talk later about uh, community conversations maybe so um, we put in the date for that which is end of june and linked a video for the climate action plan workshop which was may 4th i can't find it but um <laughs> so a lot happened in may and we also did climate ambassador training which a couple of you were able to make it to and that was really sort of having steve whitman from resilience planning and design sit down with a group of us online and just go through how to approach different groups and talk about climate issues and gather data on greenhouse gas impacts and things like that so we can gather more data and get more input for the cap strategies and things like that so coming along slowly but we're getting into event season and like tabling season so if anyone is interested in signing up to help table farmers markets market square day river fest Chowder Fest, whatever you're interested in. Um, we really appreciate it. Do you want to talk about this, the newsletter? So this mm. went out today for the it's first time. Very basic newsletter. Yeah, so that went out today. We're going to try to do it monthly, like I said. Um, this is the. Beginning. I think most of us are on the list. You guys probably, Actually, yeah, you probably all got it. If you didn't. If you didn't, I screwed up. <laughs> no, I saw it. <laughs> but yeah. I will put you all on it. Miss Jeff. So there's news and what's going on here. It's the Climate Action Plan paid, uh, video update from PHP and uh, our consultant, the Climate Action Plan, and where they what they've done so far. A uh, little news about community power. Yeah, that's rolling out soon. Mm -hmm. Just uh, trying to pull in. I was trying to pull in different community events that are happening that are along climate change, uh, but what happened to that. I think it's yeah. all sort of kicking in in June. <laughs> Where is the uh, little dashboard? I thought it was here. Oh, it's a little green blurb. It? Oh, the green blurb. Okay. That hopefully there. is there. Right. And is... we linked Bright Action. And this, so here it is. Good job. Okay. There it goes. Hopefully it works. It worked on my computer. I don't know why it's Great. not working here, but it might be something to do with the Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, no, I definitely it saw it. It definitely opened on my, <laughs> my file. So if anybody has any newsletter suggestions or things that they want to put into this newsletter that's sustainability related or climate related, send them my way throughout the month and I'll try to keep a log going of all the things that are happening or what's already happened that you want to just give like a little brief update on. So will you update monthly or can you add things like on the last thing on the community conversation? If we have some links for that when it's ready, can we just can give you those? And you can I can send out an update maybe. Um, I was thinking of doing it monthly, but... I, I can try to do it right before the community conversation at the end of June. Um, but we can also link to that on the, the page on the climate action plan one page right. too. And so Kate, if, if we forward it to people, it looks great. If we yeah. forward it to people, 
will we lose our subscription? You know what I mean? I don't think so, but it also, okay. so the sign up, the main sign up for this is on the Climate Action Plan webpage. Um, it'll say sign up for the Climate Action Plan newsletter or something like that. You just type in your email, so you can send people that too. Right. Yeah. Very small nitpicky suggestion. Please give it me help. I missed it because it came up as planning and sustainability. And you just deleted it right off the bat. And then I, <laughs> I just, I, don't want that. I think it just didn't jump because I get like just drunk all day long. Like uh -oh. I think I didn't, it didn't register. Okay. I don't know if you can change the way that's presented, yep. but if it said like climate, climate action. action newsletter or Portsmouth climate action, yeah, I'd be like, oh, it's local. It's for me. And then I would know. Oh, that's a great idea. So cl maybe climate action newsletters. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, uh, that would be helpful. That? This is how it came up. So it comes up. Just planning and sustainability. Planning and sustainability. From the department. This yeah. is great feedback. Thank you very much. Yeah. And then, I mean, I, I, so I did get it, which is good. So you, you did that right. <laughs> <laughs> I was, that was, uh, that works fine. But um, yeah, just the, the name. I think I probably just <clears throat> try just I missed it. Oh. And I, I see the parade here, and I realize I didn't add to the agenda. Laura Lee had contacted me to ask if we were doing anything about the parade participants. The parade is a week from Saturday, mm -hmm. so I'm not thinking this committee is doing much, but I just wanted to mention. So if, you know, people in this group know people, and if you can encourage bicycles, electric vehicles, walking, rickshaws, as much as possible. <laughs> Would you say a little more about the parade? Uh, for Portsmouth, New Hampshire's 400th, uh, June 3rd, there's a parade through town and they're publicizing it a lot on their website and their it's, newsletters and emails. So it's I don't know much stepping about Stepping off at 11 o'clock from Plaza 800. It's following the same route that the illuminated holiday parade takes so it's going to be whoever's up front's going to step off from um i guess just that plaza 800 then all the bands and i heard elephants or whatever else are going to fall in behind the parade as they go down past new market square i was told to expect elephants like six months ago i don't know if it's actually going to be elephants but um <laughs> And then there'll be a review stand like there is during the holiday parade in Market Square. And the same day, there's a number of other events going on. Uh, Chowder Fest at the yeah. Prescott Park and um, yeah. uh, River Fest Riverfest. as well. Yeah. So yeah, fun day. Um, on, on a positive note though, on that too, there are there is a suggestion that people um, carpool, um, and there are alternative routes because of um, anticipated challenges around traffic. And so there's already encouragement coming out from the Portsmouth 400 group and from the city to don't drive, walk if you can, or find an alternate. Or if route. you drive, there's shuttle lots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Locations you can park and get a shuttle. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And if anybody wants to table and talk about the climate action plan at the Portsmouth. Riverfest, the Scottish Riverfest. Talk to me or Kate. Hang out with me for four hours. <laughs> and I'll just make an observation. The letter already is part of the culture, and I love that. Uh, and the 400 came to Portsmouth Climate Action, and Portsmouth Climate Action, after a few days, with a lot of help from several people. Uh, and Effie putting into a paper, sent it to Ports for 400, suggesting how they can make their events more sustainable. That is system quality policy interconnectedness, uh, where I see we are synergistically getting it out and everybody is doing what they can. And somebody says, when you say, I don't know, social media, uh, somebody who I read a lot, said that we really learn a lot more from our errors than we do from our successes. <laughs> so keep that, I, I keep that, boy, I just, boy, I'm gonna learn a lot today. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Um, real quick on the newsletter, um, two questions. One, 
Um, is this just affiliated with the cap development or is this going to be an ongoing thing beyond that? I had the idea that if my position gets renewed in the budget. <laughs> <laughs> going uh, okay. Potentially. And then um, one suggestion, the city has like an overall newsletter that goes out, um, I don't know, all the time, it seems like. Um, it would probably be great to get this included in that for like a link that mentions it and people yeah. can click to sign up and join it. And, yeah. I and I see things that are on that like week after week after week after week. So that seems like it could be an ongoing thing in that too to promote it. Great point. I think um, Monty, who puts out the city newsletter, is going to put a link to it in the bottom of oh, that perfect. newsletter. So right. we'll Monty's a good advocate. And one more cap outreach thing. Um, we're, we're hoping we can get a, um, looking to get different people engaged um, and trying to do a event at either the Portsmouth of Brewery or some uh, local establishment where we can have a little talk and have people come and hear it. People like to go out to bars or to restaurants, maybe more than the council chamber. So hopefully we can get that going and get <laughs> try to a council chamber mini bar would solve that problem. Council chamber. <laughs> I can't advocate for that. <laughs> oh my God. Probably a good idea. <laughs> so, well, let's go by. Get a different crowd. Jess has one more thing. Yeah. Uh, well, I just have a broader question about the cap that was. Um, brought up last night at our Portsmouth Climate Action Meeting, Gary Eplar asked if there is a place where people can passively add suggestions about the cap or concerns or things. If there's like a Google Doc, is just like you're thinking about it and wanting to, if you can't make one of these. To send in ideas other than through yeah. the planned activities. You can email it to Caterai, but we don't really have a other than that. Yeah, I guess we could put like a up. suggestion thing on the website. Yeah. Is there one that what about one that one? There's like an enter your email to learn more info, or there's a survey you can fill out, but it's kind of a long survey monkey. I think survey. Gary was thinking, and maybe he's one of the phones up there. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, we could probably put a yeah, like a little suggestion. He, he was thinking of right. sending in an idea and then seeing if he could get some discussion and comments going on, like great idea, bad idea, or that's a good thing. Here's something else related to it. Could be like a newsletter link or something like that maybe if you want if he's trying to get people to look at it or something yeah so in social media I'm, yep. here's the line leading the blind but but in the newsletter if there is a box there has been requests from the community to uh submit their ideas in a chat room regarding the cap uh if you have an idea click on this link and we could have an ongoing page. Is that, would that to get to what? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, like would that be added to the website? Or... Like a thing where you can post a question, comment, and I, I mean, we can have it, it probably have to be moderated so it doesn't, yeah. 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 It doesn't go bad really quickly. Yeah. But... Okay, that's where you get into, uh, uh, go at the uh, speed of trust. <laughs> so that would have to be monitored. We will look into that. <laughs> okay. and, and, and actually, if you wanted feedback, I, I don't know how many people would do that, but people who took enough time to do that, and if they sent it and you are the monitors, that might be pretty good citizen input, yeah, even if it's negative. Be easy. The feedback kind of thing would be easy enough, but the chat would be a little tricky. Okay, so you need someone to beyond that right. all right so whatever uh it seems to work but that'd be good uh good because that came up well and and you know gary has an expertise in 20 30 years in energy so he's if he submitted something i think it'd be interesting oh, yeah. okay yes the other thing just with this discussion that i wondered about is that new tool that the city has what is it called quick vote quick poll or something you know, if you could incorporate yeah. flash vote, if you could incorporate a flash vote question in the newsletter, yeah. you know, what do you think of this? Have you upgraded on your energy plan or, you know, whatever? I don't know. How many of you are, 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 are knowledgeable about community power? Yeah. You know, you, have you signed up yet? <laughs> yeah. uh, what's the name of it? Flash? Flash, flash vote. vote. Oh. Yeah. I was going to encourage anyone who hasn't signed up for flash vote. 
um, please do because we're really close on the numbers to being able to go to full launch. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, here we please. go. All right. Here All right. right. How many people here are on Flash Phone? I'm signing up today. I haven't I'm signed up, so you need to help me do it. Go about signing up. I need to put that down. Um, go to the website. Look for. I, I think flash vote on our website. It should be uh, <clears throat> on the city's website. And you might be able to look at the city newsletter. There might be a link in the newsletter too. So go to the city's website and sign up for flash. Yeah, I sign up for flash. Have, but I'm not sure. I think it's just right there. I'll look. So okay. Anybody else? Okay. Because that has a lot of it. We are a, we're in a new age. People are here doing things in different yeah. places. And all right, yeah. here we go. It's, are we starting with uh, I just search for flash food. All right, then okay. we're going on. We have water uh, updates. There you go. Yep. Uh, public works update and community engagement. Yeah, you just go to flash food. Yeah, so right there. Where do we want right. to go next? Uh, I can give the keeping history above water update. Um, Thank you. Sure. I, um, I wasn't the only one who attended this conference. Peter Fritz was there and actually presented on the first day, um, the, which was fantastic. Um, the conference, um, Keeping History Above Water Conference, is an, is an international conference, and we were really lucky to, to host it here in Portsmouth because it brought in experts from um, all over, mostly um, they're from everywhere, but mostly on the East Coast in this case, um, over 150 people who um, study uh, sea level rise and ways to preserve um, historical structures around that. So um, in some ways, it's very important for Portsmouth because we are facing uh, an eventual crisis um, with our um, historic properties, especially in Prescott Park and Strawberry Bank. But also we have a lot of privately held resources that are going to be heavily impacted. Um, so um, the conference was amazing. The presenters were just incredible. Um, I had some key takeaways and, and one of those um, came from a local. And so I think it's really important. We have great resources locally. We need to take advantage of them. Um, Cameron Wake came from UNH. And for those of you who don't know Cameron Wake, um, he's a research professor in UNH. This is in his, his bio, UNH Earth. Earth Systems Research Center and Lamprey Professor in Climate and Sustainability. Um, he's a glaciologist by training. And so he presented, he, he gave an incredible presentation on what expectations we should have um, it, for climate, for sea level rise in this area. Um, and if, if we have the opportunity, I think we should invite him to come to sustainability, to talk to this committee about um, his knowledge about what is going to happen in the seacoast. Um, the other presenter that really struck me as someone that could be very helpful to us on this committee um, was actually a pair, Ian Stevenson and Sarah Hansen from the Great, Great Greater Portland Landmarks. And the reason that they were so helpful is that they have created um, a, a guide for property owners dealing with um, sea level rise. And so um, their discussion really raised um, new issues for me in thinking about the bigger policy issues we have in Portsmouth um, around things like creating new zones. Um, so we could create an overlay district in Portsmouth, a sea level rise overlay district. Um, to And we already have the research that says where we're going to be most impacted. So we could use that to create as a planning tool potentially create an overlay district. And in that district have um, initially not necessarily requirements, but recommendations for um, businesses and owners on um, what they can do, um, a guide for what they can do to protect themselves and protect their properties. And it's essentially an adaptation guide for dealing with the eventual uh, rise of water levels in those areas. And, and then we can, you know, as we see change, we can harden some of those rules and make them stricter. We already, for Portsmouth, we're already in a pretty good place. Um, as far as current rules, we have um, better um, requirements than most um, when it comes to building in or having structures within kind of a flood zone. Um, 
but we need to start thinking about what Portsmouth looks like in 2030 and 2050 and um, how many people are impacted by that and what resources are impacted and what we can do to um, adapt, mitigate um, around sea level rise. And so I wanted to um, share that with everyone here on the committee because I think this is an area we keep, we talk a lot about um, drawdown here on this committee and what we're doing around drawdown. I think though, I would like to also be talking about adaptation and mitigation because we're not we're not going to be able to um, stave off all the effects of sea level rise clearly um, and I would love to to get a group together from this committee or interested parties like a, a subcommittee to start talking about ways we can um, work within our current zoning and code and and potentially create, policies and guidebooks for the city of Portsmouth in the same way that Portland has um, for dealing with sea level rise in properties. So that, that that will help private homeowners and businesses. Adaptation and mitigation. Or do you want to say something? I was going to comment on the same thing, Bert. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 go, go, go ahead and then I'll. Uh, um, the climate action plan is supposed to address adaptation as well as mitigation, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted yeah, to. Yeah, and I just want to, um, not to steal your thunder, but no, we do have an overlay district that adds two feet of sea level, two feet yes. to, to structures. So, right, we've got regulations in place to make the downtown more, more resilient. I, I don't right. think we should stop there. There's more things we can do for sure. Exactly. Um, and we have a, in terms of historic structures, we have adaptation strategies people can use to make their, their houses more secure, but right. um, it's always a challenge to get that information out. How do you get it in people's hands or they can use it? A lot of people, education needs to be continual. So right. It's, right. it's important. And uh, so Kate, is yeah, that the I kind love... of thing you were thinking about? No, I... the information out. Yes. Well, it's not just getting the information out, but it's, it's creating, it's kind of like um, the, the land use committee right now is talking about a, um, a, a guide around ADUs mm -hmm. for individuals. And, and that's what is being created in, in Port, in Portland, like a, a handbook that can be handed out to homeowners um, to businesses that are in the impacted areas and so that they can start planning um, now because they're going to need to plan now. Um, and while we have kind of an overlay district on, you know, in some building standards, those standards are not ultimately not going to be enough. And so I love the standards we have in place, actually. And that's what I meant by Portsmouth is already much further along than most, but we're not where we need to be for 2050. And that's not that far away, you know, when you think about it. And so that's that's my biggest concern because I live on a street that, you know, four houses down from me, my neighbor is going to be underwater. So um, so I have to think about that regularly because it's, you know, it's close. it's pretty close. You know, I, I see the flooding every year. So. Hey, um and the books, the guidebooks for Portland, are they online? Could we put the links in the minutes? Um, I don't know that it's online. I was going to start working with them. This is from the Greater Portman, Portland Landmarks Organization. Reach out to them and see um, how much of their toolbox they're willing to share um, because <laughs> you know they, it's proprietary and they created it. Um, but I would like to start thinking about how we create one ourselves and um, how what are the next steps in our zoning code? Um, what are the next steps that we have to ultimately go to? Okay. No, uh, Joanne was up first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just um, sort of dovetailing into one of the other topics. Um, I know that like Effie and I have talked a lot about this being a community conversation. And I don't know if that's sort of ties into what you want to do is to make that one of the monthly meetings in the library, get more people to engage around this because I agree with you completely. It definitely, we need to be planning. Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of putting that out there is consideration. Yeah. 
Just off that. Yeah. Just off that. More conversation. Um, well, what I was thinking is um, I like the idea of, like you were saying, uh, suggestions, guidelines for existing structures, but the other side of that is anything new that's going to be built or major remodels. And that seems like it could really dovetail into what we've been talking about on the on the building committee of uh, you know another level to that as we look towards you know what do we want to do to promote efficient building in the city we could also look at that um, overlay district and say well and within this area we should really have different codes that are for adaption for that for the next twenty five years. Right. That would make perfect sense to me. I love that's almost a segue, Jess, and to what you were saying, Kate. Um, what I love is that we need to think long term and short term. We need it, and I think uh, I have my map. My next door neighbor is underwater, and I'm not. I'm the dry. So <laughs> you got people's Spot attention. Right house. Yeah, you got people's <laughs> attention. What I love, which I think I've gotten a lot from Bill, is, and this is for the cap, and I think this is what most of people are trying to think about, is the co-benefits. So if we're going to do adaption, that, okay, we need to adapt. That, that's practical. But as we adapt, are we forming the culture and the sustainability pattern that is going to put us in correct relationship to a sustainable future or climate safe planet. So we can adapt. And I think what the creativity would be come up, get people like Cameron Wake, get people like Peter, get people whoever have and say, here's the reality. How do we synergize what we know about resilience and what we know about what's going to bring down our carbon footprint and what's going to create the culture where our kids are going to live in a climate safe planet. Put those together and inspire all of us to get on board. That's kind of where, yes. Yeah, and I, I think uh, there's a little bit of a danger living in the coast to just think of adaptation in terms of shoreline. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to think about extreme heat and other weather that we've been seeing. But particularly extreme hit, heat, when you talk about co-benefits, there's real health issues and allergies now, asthma, rates of asthma going up with longer seasons and different pollinators coming up. Also, um, a couple other things come to mind, wildfire air quality. Uh, that's been something that I've noticed a lot. And um, I heard on uh, NPR the other day, there is actually, I don't know, I forget the details of it, but there's essentially a uh, gathering taking place, I believe in Keene, uh, which is all about climate refugees and how New England is going to become a sort of a safe haven, <laughs> maybe not Portsmouth necessarily being on the water, but New England is going to be a... Um, sort of a, a high ground, literally and figuratively, for people to seek uh, who are displaced by, by climate change. And actually, it was very interesting. They were talking about um, melting ice caps in the Arctic and how that water is going to uh, make its way, or so that melted water is going to make its way to the equator. And there are going to be a lot of Americans living uh, on the Gulf of Mexico that are going to be forced inland or, or away from their homes. And um, this might be further down, downstream to continue the water uh, metaphor, but there's also going to be a infrastructural component with housing, uh, building, as if we have enough, uh, don't have enough housing problems to deal with as it is. Um, but also that resiliency and that mitigation will, will probably have to take into account a, a population surge as well. Just to add to that, Ben, that what you're referring to was a conference in Keene called Local, Sol Local Solutions for Climate Change. It was put on by Antioch University, and it was all about. Okay. Yes. Keene was climate migration. Yeah, that's the one. It's a big. It's a big topic now because people are moving from hot places, from wildfire places, mm -hmm. from places where they can't farm. Yep. 
to places where they can. And so there's this migration happening, not necessarily clear lines of where people are going, but they're trying to understand it. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I was recently corrected using the term climate refugee because I had met mm. some people moving here because of wildfires out west. They're quite wealthy. And to use the <laughs> term climate refugee really didn't work so well. So other people suggested climate migrant. Yeah. And I don't know that that's the correct term, but maybe we could think in those terms. That's a good for now. Yeah, I like that. Probably some of both. Honestly. Probably better than refugees. And when we think of refugees, I, I, yeah. Well, uh, I was saying to my wife, because uh, there was a film on uh, Netflix about the swimmers oh, yeah. who from Syria, who uh, is a true story about people who went from the difficulty of what happens when you leave your country, very powerful. And I was commenting that when I started teaching sustainability, 30 some odd years ago, there was a really sharp doctoral student in our class. And he said, Bert, you know what the future is going to be about? Climate refugees. And that was 30 years ago. And so uh, I think uh, where we need the big, big umbrella, and it's hard to get it. So uh, that's why I think this community of practice needs to bring in all of these views. So we uh, start thinking now and in the future. So great conversation for me. Uh, all right, does that take care of uh, the water update? Is mm -hmm. that where we, number nine, is that it? Water and no, other. That was seven. Yes, seven? Yep. Which, which yes. one was? No, seven. 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 All right, so uh, public works update, is that a different? Yep, I, I can do that really quick. And Tori, Peter, please chime in. Um, so we met today with Peter Rice and Joel Mita uh, at Public Works to present the draft of the municipal um, building efficiency. I forget exactly. Green building called. policy. I think. Green building policy, yeah. Um, to go over that with them, get feedback. Uh, I would say it was a mixed uh, reception. Um, on one hand, they're uh, like, well, we already do most of these things. We build the buildings and we're building new. And, and so on one hand, they feel like they're already kind of doing this, uh, which is not wrong. Um, but on the other hand, they are really leery about anything that they feel kind of puts handcuffs on them or creates extra work. Um, so we ask them to review it, especially on... Um, like not so much on a on a brand new project because they're already going to do a lot of these things and that isn't as um, onerous a lift. But um, when it was like, oh, every time you're, uh, you know, redoing an HVAC system over so many dollars or anytime you're putting on a new roof over so many square feet, uh, there was a lot more resistance to that because um, they just felt like it was complicated enough. They already don't have enough time or money to do what they need to do that they're mandated to do. Um, and um, that it was gonna be hard to um, do that if there's more bureaucratic things that they have to go through. So we asked them to look over those and try to um, uh, give us some feedback on ways that we can still keep a lens on that whenever they're doing those without maybe being a burdensome to them on a bureaucratic side. You say that's yeah, I think right. So. Yeah, I think so. I think they didn't. They have certain constraints on what you know when we redo facilities and redo infrastructure. There's there's often not enough budget to expand that project, so it's it's the challenge of how do you do that. And but it seems like they were open to at least reviewing it and, and giving us feedback. And I think it'll be a stronger document because of that. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then one other point that they were really pushing back on, Peter especially, was the idea of every project that goes into the um, capital improvement plan to have a, a carbon analysis done of it. Um, they thought that that didn't have a lot of value, would add a lot of bureaucratic uh, <clears throat> work for them to do. And um, they really pushed back on that a lot, I think is mm -hmm. fair to say. Uh, yeah, I think it's more of not understanding what not not enough clarity on what was being asked also. So right. it was the fear of what it could turn into, I think was part of it, you know, because that happens too sometimes, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Um was the 
proposal or the paper that you gave to public works about city buildings yes. specifically? Okay. Yeah. And so, um, so are there things that we could forward to the climate action plan policy ideas that would make sense to go in the climate action plan? I, I think probably a lot of what's in there will already be part of the climate action plan. And that's well, yeah, I think part of what we discussed with them too is like this is we're just getting a little ahead of the climate action plan, but these are probably all things that will be a result of that as well. Yeah, but the goal with this document is to get the city to um, stand behind a policy that we can then come up with regulations that we send out to the community and say, well, the city's already doing these things. Right. We're, you know, we found these to be effective and we had to work through it and we got here and, and we'd like to put them in the community and see where we can get to the community. But, I think we wanted that city buy-in before we push the community to do it because it's sometimes it's going to be a hard sell for developers and business people that want to build things, green buildings. Um, even though we can demonstrate a lot of benefits and cost savings and things like that, sometimes people don't you know they don't like the change. So at least having the city say that we have these policies, we we do actually do green buildings in all our new buildings. We've always built the last four or five buildings have been LEED certified, but. Um, this is a way to document that and, and take that out and say, here's here's what the city's doing. Here's what we're trying to get implemented for everybody who builds in the city, private property owners especially. So um, that's kind of the goal of this. And then, so the climate action plan will probably also say, you know, it's gonna have recommendations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And one of them I imagine is gonna be something along the lines of if you build green buildings, if you require people to build green buildings, you'll have X reduction in your greenhouse gases if X number of buildings are built, kind of thing. But will the gonna cap, get there anyway? But. Will the cap get down to the specific type policies that you were talking about in the document? Uh, I doubt that they're gonna be that detailed. but not that detailed, yeah. It would probably be more of a general policy rather than the details of that policy if I had to because it seems I had like, to guess from the budget we gave them. It seems like <laughs> yeah. a lot of the work you and Tori have done could advance what's going in the climate action plan. So. Tori, do you have additional thoughts, comments? Yeah, I think I, oh, sorry, my camera's not on. Um, I think I agree in the sense of, I mean, I agree with everything that Aubrey in his summary um, and what Peter said. I would just say, no, the cap is not going to inform to this level. You know, it, it's similar to on like the transport side, it'll, you know, say alternative ways of travel, but it's not going to tell you where to put your bike lanes. <laughs> um, so I think this is a similar, you know, we, broke it down into kind of specific attributes of green building and the standards we'd like to see met on those attributes or in a lot of cases standards we're already meeting but we don't have an actual policy saying that we do um i think yeah the the biggest sticking point really was that inclusion in the cip which i can understand because the the concept of calculating emissions especially in like the embodied carbon as well as the operational emissions in a building is i don't want to say it's new because it's not but it's newer in implementation and it is you know if you're not familiar with it is a lot more work and then later on right like anything it becomes streamlined so i think yeah maybe more definition there or also just looking at what you know, what battle is worth taking on that. Um, I mean, I, I I think that it's a good practice because it informs all of our decisions, not just once the decision is made, then making sure it's better, but are we making the right decisions to start with? Are we starting every project under this lens? Um, you know, same reason, and Aubrey brought this up in the meeting, I thought it was a great example of uh, it's the same reason we put a rough budget <laughs> on everything in our CIP. We know it's not going to be, it's not the actual cost. That's not going to come until the project's designed and we have somebody, you know, bidding on it. But it gives the community and DBW an idea of how to move forward. And I kind of think of doing an emissions amount um, the same because the cap is going to, you know, be suggesting that these are the types of things we look at and consider. So I'm hoping that maybe we can keep some semblance of that in there and work with 
Joe and Peter on the language um, that would feel less burdensome to them, um, but still achieve that goal of having the CIP reflect the climate goals that the city has already adopted and agreed upon and that the cap will likely continue to push. Um, as far as you know, the technical side, I think I'm excited to see their comments. Um, you know, they're gonna have more insight onto how each one of these things specifically um, could have impacts. And we want this to be a policy that's implemented on the whole and not have small things that are seemingly avoidable sink the whole ship. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I I feel like we're going in the right direction. I don't think any of it was super unexpected. Um, you know, they're already under tight restraints and they don't have an easy job. So, <laughs> you know, I think uh, there's also probably something to be said for us keeping that in mind as we move forward on projects, especially projects that directly tie into DVW and making sure that we're doing our part, you know, we are asking them to implement a lot of these things at the end of the day. And when things like the budget comes around or when things need promotion or whatever it might be that we as a group can help with that a little bit um, as, you know, we're moving together as a city towards better infrastructure in multiple ways. Um, and we need to support the people who are doing that. But yeah, we're, um, I know we're hoping to bring the actual, once we have those comments and we've hopefully gotten into it, kind of that final draft, um, we do want to provide it to you all to look at. So I think that's an important step um, and needs to happen, I think, before we bring it to the city manager, I believe. And Peter can correct me on that. So yeah, that's my two cents. Sorry. You're all set? I think so. Unless there's any questions or feedback. I got a question on. So for you want a uh, carbon emission study on any construction, new construction, retrofits, like which the, how the, far would the thing was anything that made it into the capital improvement plan would have at least some base level. Um, analysis the emissions that that's going to create, and either adding operationally and um, embodied. I just wondered if there wasn't a way to sort of like make it less painful for them by sort of phasing it in, like so when you start next year, anything that's like just sort of design build from the ground up that has to incorporate it, but not necessarily if we're redoing part of, you know, City Hall over here, this wing over there, uh, just like sort of start phasing it in gradually, would that be less painful for them? Yeah, and, I mean, the, my, my take on it generally is that you can only change something that you measure. You don't know mm -hmm. where you're starting from and you can't make adjustments to it. And and like Corey's point was like, say we, you know, do an analysis on mm -hmm. what the embodied carbon is on a, you know, section of sidewalk down, Beverly Hill Road. Well, that's great. You know, okay, you figure that out, and it's like, okay, wow, that's a lot of embodied carbon in that concrete because concrete is very heavy in carbon intensity. So, what can we do to change that? You know, and and until you start having that conversation, you don't even know. It's kind of like 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 Tori was saying. You know, we said you you look at the budget for those projects. Nobody wants to spend money. Everybody wants a sidewalk. So it's like, okay, how much is that sidewalk mm -hmm. going to cost? You know, and and then you debate. Okay, are we going to spend it on this? Are we going to spend it on that? But until you have numbers and are starting to play around with that budget, then you don't really have anything to talk about. And and you know other committees are already in out analyzing all of the city's um, carbon emissions, so they're doing it retroactively. We're just saying we should be doing it proactively as well. What are we adding to that number as we build new things, and is there ways to limit how much we're adding? One more clarifying question. So was this specifically around? Brownfield projects or greenfield or both? This is um, just municipal projects, okay. projects that the city owns in this building, like redoing something in this building or one of the schools or the new police station or uh, roads, sidewalks, parking lots, basically anything public works touches. 
And was the pushback more on being able to collect the data or sharing the data? Uh, it wasn't on sharing the data. It was just an added burden to, so it's another to, step. to do that analysis. It's just an extra step. Yeah. Another, another, another body, essentially, that's going to have to do it. Or, or, okay. You know, mm -hmm. um, okay. And I think, you know, I think it's understandable. I think at the same time, it's something that we're going to end up doing more and more of, and we're going to be recommending more and more in terms of like the climate action plan and other things. It's, you know, it's not just the cost of the building, it's what's the cost of carbon for that building. And it's, it's going to happen everywhere, I think. So it's really just a matter of time. A lot of communities are doing it already. So, yeah, and a lot of times it's good to do, like, say, I mean, in, you know, one of the um, phrases that gets bounded or bandied around a lot is, you know, the most uh, sustainable building you can build is one that's already built. You know, so it's like, okay, we need a new police station. Okay, do we need a new police station? You know, what would be better? Is it better to try to retrofit what's there rather than building an entire new thing? And, you know, weigh both the climate impact of that, cost impact of that, and the impact of their operations. You know, if it's just operations, of course, the police department's going to say, yes, we need a new building. Um, is the city going to say, we want to spend however much, $50 million on a new police station? Maybe we will, maybe we won't. But then if you weigh the carbon impact of it too, that's just another factor to consider in that balance. Thanks. I'm aware of time. And yep. that actually worked out from where retrofit the middle school or build a new one. Yeah. It was very the similar. sustainability aspect of people walking. That was a big issue that kept renovation rather than doing the building. So I really think that this is, if it wasn't having some resistance, then I'd be surprised because it sounds like it could have a big impact. So, <laughs> so thank you for that update. All right. So we have, uh, I'd like 10 minutes for closing. So we have one last item, which is community engagement. Um, and I think Bill is going to make a presentation on that. But um, I, I would do, want me to do the context for it. Short and sweet. Short and sweet. I can do it in <laughs> 12 seconds. <laughs> <clears throat> the climate action plan and the consultants hired will be here for a year. Community conversations would hopefully be an ongoing systems <clears throat> component that would reinitiate itself each year. So we start in May, June, July, August, September, and have a community conversation each month. And we would, we're starting it off, and Bill will tell you about the first one that we're going to do small coming up in May, then already Jess was saying, okay, Kate, maybe we could do this. Or we would be having the structure that we could put these conversations in. So the content will vary. And the end goal is to support the climate action plan, whose end goal is to get us to a climate safe planet. And I'll just say that, uh, one of the outcomes, and this is the last piece, of community conversations, that there would be communities of practice, defining communities of practice as a group of people who have a passionate common value about some item, and then they continue to meet through time, so they build trust, and they wind up in action. So it has those components. And that's the context for our first one. Great. And <laughs> one minute and 15 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> the, the idea is that these not be one offs, that these be the beginnings of a focus on the major sectors that are both the contributors and potentially the sources of the reductions of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, we've talked in this committee about the community conversations and about the possibility of having a, a transportation and smart growth as the first one. And that's come together very, very well. Uh, it will be co-hosted on 
June 29th, and Kate had that as the last item on the newsletter. So thank you very much for turning that around so so quickly today on that. So June 29th, Levinson Room, 6.30 to 8. Everyone hopefully can, can join us for that. Uh, we've talked at prior meetings about the structure for that. It's uh, going to be co-hosted by Portsmouth Climate Action slash TCAG, Transportation Climate Action Group, and Portsmouth Smart Growth. So we'll be organizing it and hosting it together. Uh, we'll begin with a, um, I think we've looked at the agenda, and uh, an introduction and welcome. And I think hopefully Kate and, and or Peter will join us and give us a, uh, a CAP update and um, anchor this as part of the climate ambassadors activities. Um, I think we have a room that seats 100, but I think with a month to really roll out the publicity, I think we'll take what we can get. I think it'll probably be a small informal meeting. We're really hoping for a conversation the reality is that you often get the people who are already thinking about the topic and it's very difficult to get a broader audience. I think we'll try for that. But since this isn't a one-off, it's uh, the beginning. Even if we get the land use smart growth people and Portsmouth smart growth and their distribution and constituency, you get the transportation people, folks working on TCAG, uh, Sabre, and then you get others interested in transportation to talk to each other that's a plus. Sabre doesn't think about climate. Uh, coast and um, other transportation issues don't think about climate. Climate people don't necessarily think that much about transportation and land use, but to get all together, talking together and um, um, around the goal of what would it take to reduce transportation sector greenhouse gases, uh, both through shifting to low carbon modes and uh, shifting to uh, EVs and alternative fuels. That'll be the focus. We'll have context setting for each of the key transportation topics, probably about five minutes, uh, maybe a little bit on the importance of the, of the topic, food, really food for thought to get people engaged. Then we'll have uh, breakout sessions for each of those that will be facilitated by a combination of TCAG and Portsmouth Smart Growth folks, and then a uh, report back, written summaries that then will go to um, to the city and to Steve, the uh, the community engagement consultant on the CAP as, as input. And I think the ideal is to start forming a um, community of, of practice of people interested in this uh, in a focus. And if we can get some people that are not the usual suspects, I mean, the usual suspects will be a gain if we can go beyond that, that'll be a, a wonderful thing, but it, it may take a follow-up and some additional communications. We've talked about this being a pilot, so we're gonna try it for this because we've done so much prep on it. See how that goes for other topics. Um, tonight, we talked about adaptation and resilience as a, a, a great next topic. We're hoping maybe to do these things monthly. Last night on Portsmouth Climate Action, just had a an idea. I don't know if you want to mention that maybe as the next one. I mean, we're, we're looking at this first one, the end of, of June, and hopefully some some to follow, but it will depend on the, the interest of folks to do the organizing and ideally to find some partners to do it with. And I, I think that's why this first one is, is really nice because it's Portsmouth Climate Action and TCAG with Portsmouth uh, Sustain um, Smart Growth. And I have suggested um, waste and specifically kind of looking at plastic and recycling and composting since it's plastic free July anyway, thought it might be a good conversation to have in the month of July. So we'll offer this first one as a pilot and a template to be reviewed, evaluated, adapted. Uh, we'll get uh, input from, from Steve on the structure of it and what we can do to organize it to make sure that uh, we can um, generate as much useful information on this. At, at one point, you'd suggest it may be doing a follow-up survey to get more ideas. Where we could really use help in is in getting the word out. And we'll, I think we'll start with the distribution lists for the sponsoring organizations for, for this committee. Um, we'll get as much help suggestions from, from uh, Kate on 
getting the information out um, via city channels and all other ideas. Welcome. <clears throat> And we had on um, Portsmouth Climate Action, we had five topic areas. So transportation and land use, waste and plastic, buildings, buildings and energy, preparedness and resilience, and natural resources and environment. And we have food. Peter. I'd just say, um, I, I know you're having it at the library, but have you been talking to the library about getting the word out too? They have some good networks that they get things out through. So. We did talk about that last night and maybe connecting with them. Yeah. I don't know if they would want to be a co-sponsor, but it's certainly that would be welcome. And um, having them get the word out through their ch channels would be great as well. And the planning and sustainability department respond. Great. I mean, I don't know if you wanted to keep a, a, a formal city, you know distance be between it or do you if you want to because I I think we're going to put together a um, an announcement with uh, Portsmouth smart growth TK PCA logos we could we could add one for the library and for for um, planning and sustainability yeah. if you like great Woo. <laughs> it's good to be last uh, given the last 10 minutes. Uh, if there's, and I think we went through the agenda, I'd like to do the closing. Um, what are our last thoughts and take away? And we're going to, next week, we have an issue we need to decide on the, the facilitation for the next meeting. Uh, it looks like we have the Portsmouth Eco Club. Will we have someone here? Uh, uh, we can rustle up some troops and r rally the troops and maybe put something together. I wouldn't rely. Maybe try our best to can try. Uh, yeah, will be. Summer. Wouldn't necessarily want to throw a brand new person into the facility. Oh, that is very that's true. A good, <laughs> that's a good point. A good they point. might show a few meetings to get uh, acclimated yeah. first. So, <laughs> we defer. Could we switch or defer? Well, we can. Oh, we're very flexible. <laughs> but I just was aware that that's. At least what I see coming up with Laura Lee. So, Kate, Kate, Kate would. Be Kate had so. you facilitated though. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. I, after the Eco Club, it would be uh, Laura Lee. Uh, okay. Who is this recorder? Technically, an Eco Club member, member, so she could maybe still come until she goes to college in the fall. Okay. I did. She'll be traveling over the summer. Oh, okay. Yeah. She goes to Africa. If not, we would go, we would skip down to Jess Belasco. Okay. Would you be okay? <laughs> sure. So I'm facilitating. In the meantime. And, and then and then Josh then would do the notes. Who's in Elizabeth? Are they also all right. you? Or, um, all house. right. Uh, having, yes. Can I? Um, make one more little request before we do the closing question. Sure. Um, I spoke with Christina Dubin about a program that she's hoping to launch called Skip the Stuff. Okay. And Jess knows about this. And I was hoping to invite her into our next meeting in June. So I was hoping we could get her on the agenda because that launch would probably take place July 1st. And so this would be an opportunity to talk to this committee before that. Yeah, launches. love lover. She's certainly enthusiastic about sustainability. Good. Yeah. Put it on the agenda, but remind us if you don't see it on. All right, put it on now. All right, the closing. Uh, last thoughts or takeaways. And I'm going to start and go around to wind up with the Eco Club. And I'd like them to have, uh, if we keep ours brief, I'd like you to have a few minutes uh, just to, um, to reflect on your experience. Uh, see what comes up in a couple of minutes, just to summarize what it is like for you to have been on and where you are now. Um, and uh, my takeaway is um, 